Thomas Edison said, his uh, Edison's ethic, he said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. <laughs> and I've seen that close up. You know, I've seen that with Professor Chomsky. Chomsky, he was blessed. He got the 1%. But boy, oh boy, did he ever do that 99%. Mm -hmm. That man work, works. I don't know now what the, his output is. But that man put in uh, 20 hours a day. Yes, he put in 20 hours a day. You know, sometimes, just a funny story, and then we'll move on. I used to spend uh, some time during the summer each year at his summer home, he and his wife and myself. And I was in the guest room downstairs, and the guest room was near the computer where he worked. And sometimes in the middle of the night, I'd hear a pat, 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 pat. And I would say to myself, okay, there are two possibilities. It's raining, and it's the raindrops on the roof, or that guy is on the computer. <laughs> I said, I don't want to know. It's going to depress me. So I'm keeping the door shut. But of course, he was working. Incredible. Eight hours a day just answering the email. He will answer, even to this day, right away, answers an email right away. Any question you could have. Yeah, but now it's a little different. With all due regard to the great, you know, God is great, God is good, let us thank known for our food. We've said the prayer. Um, <laughs> I think now he answers so quickly, the email, he answers because he doesn't have the concentration anymore for the work. Mm. You know, he is 93. Right, right, right. So I think that... Because he has a real, he's an, he's an old-fashioned kibbutznik. And I'm not saying that as a joke. He's a kibbutznik. Hard work. That's your resume, that's your, But of course, he gets it from his, his family. But he has that kibbutznik ethic. So I think in his mind, so long as he's typing, working, he's justifying his existence, even though it's emails and it's not books. <laughs> it used to be said there was a famous anti-war um uh, religious figure named William Sloan Coffin. He was over at Yale. And William Sloan Coffin, I remember once he said, he was introducing Professor Chomsky, and he said, Professor Chomsky writes books faster than I read them. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's true. It's crazy, though. I was thinking about that when I was looking at um, a copy of, I can't remember which which book one of Badia's books and you look in the beginning of it and you see what he's published and it's just and it's not everything and it'll go on for like three pages about 150 books i mean you're that's like, how like, are you writing i mean this? At, at that territory you're getting into i mean two of my personal idols uh the novelist percival everett and of course uh howard hunt uh as far as their uh prolific literary output goes <laughs> i have a couple of howard hunt books with, with all due regard I cannot accept the um, equivalency here. <laughs> <laughs> Please, it was not offered seriously. Forgive me. Because uh, Professor Chomsky, first of all, he's not just writing, as it were, stream of consciousness. No, yeah. Every book comes with a voluminous scholarly apparatus. Mm. I mean, that's just a huge amount of research that goes to each book. And I can tell you, with pretty much certainty, except for let's call it the last 10 or 15 years. But for the first period, I knew all of his books inside out, backward, forward, left left to right, right to left, up and down. Uh, he did not really repeat footnotes. It was <laughs> new research with each mm. book. It was, he was a force of nature because in so many levels, there was the correspondence there was the lecturing. He was on the go all the time. Here, there, around the world. I remember once his wife said to me, Carol Chomsky, they went to India. They come back from India. He then has to go the next day to Brazil. He said, I'm exhausted. <laughs> he was just zigzagging the globe. Mm. He once told me that in the plane, he could never sleep on the plane. He said, his was <laughs> the only light on in the plane. The only light on. 
He is reading. He is reading. He said once there was a woman sitting next to him, and she recognized who he was, and she wouldn't shut up. And finally, he, he turned up the music, he said, to pretend he can't hear her because he wanted to, she wouldn't leave him alone. He wanted to concentrate on his reading. Uh, he, he, he's a phenomenon. He's a force of nature. Do you guys um, still correspond? No. You know, I, I want to be honest about that. I could pretend, you know, I'm one of Chomsky's special people. No, it's not true. And I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I was uh, close to him and I was close to his wife. And they had very different, they're both, you know, she's a, she was a brilliant woman. But uh, she was more, let's just call it down to earth. And I w I'm also down to earth. I mean, I, I, I liked going shopping with her in the supermarket, and she has her coupons, and, you know, it reminds me of growing up. <laughs> and uh, so I was sort of like a compromise. They both liked me. Now, that was unusual, because she didn't like most <laughs> people he liked, and vice versa, in general, in general. So I was a compromise. So they both liked me, and that made me tolerable around both of them. But once she passed away, uh, we kind of drifted apart, you know, and and that was okay for me because occasionally we would see each other in the years after his wife passed away. We'd meet up in Cambridge or Lexington. No, no, Cambridge. We'd meet up in Cambridge or Boston, and uh, we would talk. I'd ask how the kids are, you know, the usual Jewish sort of talk. How are the mm -hmm. kids? Da, 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 da. How are the grandchildren? Mm -hmm. Uh, but then it was like when we got around to talking about other issues, we were just repeating ourselves from the past. Mm. It was the same stories, you know, the same war stories, right, the right, same right, right. things about the same people, you know, isn't she a shit, isn't he a, you know, a schmuck, and then I said, the same thing. And I realized I got everything out of him that I could. He was a resource, a human resource for me. I got everything out of him I could. And if I were to persist, a lot of people persist because they want to be able to say they were close to Noam Chomsky. You know, it's an honor. It's, it's, a, it's a feather in your cap. And I didn't need that anymore. In fact, I didn't want it anymore because I didn't want to be derivative. I wanted to be mm -hmm. my own person. If you want to know me, I want you to want to know me because of me, not because I'm, you know, close to Noam Chomsky. It didn't feel good after a while. It's nice to be a protege when you're in your 30s. It becomes a little bit problematic when you're in your 40s. And it becomes downright humiliating once you get into your 50s. <laughs> either, you, either you are your own person or you're not. And... I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't struggle to be part of the inner circle. I didn't mm -hmm. struggle to be part of the inner circle. I, I didn't want it. I didn't, I, I, I have my honor. I have my pride. I didn't want to be a groupie, which is effectively, you know, what it is, you know, to be a groupie, to cling to somebody just so you can go around boasting. Mm. Oh, you're my friend. That's why I never call him Noam. Never. Mm. Everybody calls him Noam because he signs his letters now, you know? And they all want to show their, you know, buddy with him. So they say Noam. I always say Professor Chomsky. Just, I don't want to be part of that groupie phenomenon. It's degrading. It's degrading. And I have my personal honor. Either I achieved something in my life or I didn't. And if I didn't, it's not, the verdict is not going to change because I knew Noam Chomsky. The verdict remains the same. And uh, so, no, I wouldn't say we, uh, we remain in close touch. Uh, he moved out to Arizona around three years ago. And before that, I occasionally saw him. And now, no, I don't see him. I don't feel bad. <laughs> I was blessed. He entered my life for about 30 years, and 
I learned a lot. He gave me his time. He read everything I wrote. He returned it with extensive criticism. He taught me in some respects, not totally, he taught me how to think. And that was important. Uh, I did not get my moral core from him. I got my moral core, core, core from my parents. Mm. But what he gave me, which I didn't know how to do, I didn't know how you combine passion and reason. I didn't know how you combine indignation and reason. I didn't know how you mesh those two. My, my late mother hated intellectuals and she hated intellectualizing. She hated intellectualizing when people were talking about war and um, the idea of just sitting around and talking about it like you're talking about a book. Right. You know. Like that distancing. Yeah, that distancing. It, it wasn't even distancing because they had no idea what war was. Right, right, right. So I, I didn't know how to retain, preserve the indignation over what my parents endured, but at the same time, keep to the highest scholarly standards because I believe in the life of, you know, in my modest way, I'm not Kant, I recognize that, but in my own modest way, I believe in the life of the mind. Uh, it's just something I grew up with. Uh, my friends are smart and intellect was important, reason was important, and I didn't quite know how to do it until he gave me, a, he was like a practical example of how you do both. You retain your indignation, but you also make the coherent, logical, evidence-based argument. Mm. 